days of Elijah, declaring the word of the Lord. And these are the days of your servant Moses, righteousness being restored. And these are the days of great trials, of famine and darkness and sword. So we are the voice in the desert, crying, prepare ye the way. Come on, you know it. Behold, he comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun. At the trumpet calls, lift your voice, the year of jubilee. Out of Zion till salvation comes. Sing that second verse. And these are the days of Ezekiel. Do you believe it? The dry bones becoming as flesh. And these are the days of your servant David rebuilding that temple of praise. Yeah. And these are the days of the harvest The fields are as wide in your world Then we are the laborers in your vineyard Declaring the word of the Lord Behold, He comes Riding on the clouds Shining like the sun As the trumpet calls So lift your voice It's the year of Jubilee Zion still sound. Behold, he comes. Behold, he comes. Riding on the clouds, shining like the sun. At the trumpet calls, lift your voice. The year of Jubilee. Out of Zion still salvation comes. See, there is no other God. There's no God like Jehovah. 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 Sing it from way, way down. There's no There's no God like Jehovah. 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 Sing it again. There's no God. There's no God like Jehovah. 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 Behold, He comes riding on the clouds, shining like the sun. Trumpet calls, so lift your voice. It's the year of Jubilee. Out of Zion till sound. One more time, behold, behold, he comes riding on the clouds, shining like the sun. At the trumpet calls, so lift your voice. It's the year of Jubilee. Out of Zion till salvation comes. Hallelujah. Heaven and welcome to Dr. Jan Venter as he comes and minister the words of God. A man that hears from God. Travel the world here today. We love you, sir. Thank you, dear people. Thank you. Thank you. you may be seated. Thank you. I tell you what, you know, I've been in a ministry for 49 years now, full time, and uh, I've traveled around, I've seen places I've been to places, met people all around the world. But I'll tell you what, it, it uh, takes a lot to impress me anymore because uh, I've seen so much. But i tell you what, uh, I was impressed when I arrived here today. I'm impressed with your worship. I'm impressed with the way that you obviously are ready to move with God. And I think you've only seen the beginning of what is going to happen. Yes. Now, you know, uh, I've been with uh, P- Pastor McGregor and his family before in the other place where they were in Nashville. 
And my wife and I just could not uh, understand why that thing did not take off big time. I've known the McGregor family for a long, long, long time. <laughs> I, I, I've known them, you know, I think uh, since 1973, I think I met your dad. Uh, the McGregor family is the, and I'm, I, you know, I take pleasure in saying this. They're the most incredible family you will ever meet. I mean, every one of them, every one of them, you know. Um, and, and, you know, how, how many sons did your dad have? Seven? Seven boys. And I think they're, and one girl. And... Um, they're just not good in producing girls. <laughs> you know, they... Uh, uh, what, you have five sons and one girl. You know, they just don't have the recipe down. <laughs> There's just no proper balance there. But every, every one of their dad's sons, I believe, are serving God in the ministry. Their dad was... The most incredible guy you will ever have to meet, have had the pleasure of meeting. They, he's just incredible, you know, just incredible. And um, you guys were blessed by the Holy Spirit to have him direct this family here to your church. Yeah. <laughs> been great. Just been great. I, I am so happy, I'm telling you, I am so, so happy extremely happy and um, and I'm sure that the other brothers are happy too the way that God is pouring out his blessing because it's all the Lord it's not it's not them you know I, I've heard a pastor in Swaziland tell me um, Apostle Jeremiah did you ever meet him uh, they started with a small little work there like, like I think 10 people and forever it took them to reach 100 people. And then all of a sudden, revival broke open. And uh, the next time I went there, they were running over 7,000 people. And so he was telling me, because uh, I asked him, I said, Jeremiah, how did this happen? I mean, where did it happen? He said, I don't know. He said, I still preach exactly the same. I, and there's nothing different in any of my preaching. It's just all of a sudden, everything I did, God blessed it. It's, it's time. Say it. It's time. it's time. See, when you reach that moment, see, that's one of the things, one of the things uh, about the, uh, the tribe of, uh, one of the tribes of Israel. Uh, what, who was it? Um, that new time, um, Ishakar. Thank you. They they knew how to discern the time. That's one of the one of the problems that I find as I go around at the nation. There's so many churches that do not. They're unable to discern the time. You know that's something we can learn from uh, from the world. You go to these department stores. And it's still winter time, and you want to go and get some winter clothes, and when you get in there, it's all summer clothes. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. And then you ask them, you know, where's your summer clothes? No, we're getting ready for the winter. Uh, I mean, for the summer. Uh, where's your winter clothes? You know, we're getting ready for the summer, or whatever. And, uh, you know, they know there's a new season coming. And I'm telling you right now, there's a new season coming. <laughs> And all you have to do is to position yourself correctly. Get yourself ready, you know. If you can't help it, you know, don't sit in the back rows. Run for the front seats, you know. This is where the blessings are poured out. You know, those black, uh, back rows, they're just not good. <laughs> they're not good. You see every movement. You get distracted easily. Uh, you know, it's so much better to be in the front seats. Nobody distracts you. You focus on the Lord. Uh, and you go out and you say, man, it was great to be in the house of the Lord. You sit in the back rows and you'll go home and, you say, and your wife will say, did you see what kind of dress Susie had on? You know, 
We just, you know, we're not interested in that stuff. We want to just get the best out of the Lord. Come on, give him a hand clap of praise, will you? Glory to God. I, I, just, have, I just have a feeling that we're going to have a great time here this week. Will you give him another hand clap of praise? Glory to God. My mother-in-law, she's with me uh, here. It's a very rare opportunity that she's with me, too. She's 94. And, uh, and, uh, and she's single. She's just, uh, you know, when I, when I uh, asked to marry my wife, she fought me tooth and nail. I mean, we, we debated and really argued the entire night through. I'm not kidding you. The following morning when the sun came up, she, she finally gave in, didn't you? <laughs> she almost missed it. She almost missed it, you know. <laughs> you know, uh, it's terrible to miss a, an opportunity and miss God. Uh, I want you to look at your neighbor and say, we're not going to miss this move of God. <laughs> Go ahead. <clears throat> and then uh, my wife is here with me. We've been married for um, almost 50 years. Uh, 49 years now, almost 50 years. Yeah, Go ahead. <laughs> Uh, I, I'll have her come and talk tonight. This morning, I want you to, uh, we'll start the revival tonight. This morning, I want to just minister to uh, uh, each and every one of you in a different way here. But uh, we, we're going to look for signs and wonders. You know, that's what God's word says. Signs and wonders will follow. That's one of the things wrong with the church. You know, they're too focused on programs. You know, let's expect the supernatural. Let's expect God to do something Phenomenal. Amen. Praise God. Take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Ecclesiastes 3. Uh, I'm going to title this message this morning, It's Time. Ecclesiastes chapter 3. And uh, starting in verse 1, well known uh, portion of scripture. Uh, the preacher writes and he says, For everything. There's an appointed time. And then he goes on to break down these segments. You know, that's one thing you must understand that all of us, every one of us, we are locked into a time zone. Everything about us plays off with time connected to it. The moment time runs out, that's it. You're dead. In 1996, I fell off a four-story building. And I'll share my testimony later. I fell off a four-story building and I was dead for a half an hour. I opened my eyes in Beulah land. I was in heaven physically. I mean, I saw heaven like I see you here right now. And for the first time, I became aware of what it's like to not be connected to time. No time whatsoever. You don't feel an organ move inside of you to remind you that second after second is pushing you towards destiny. You have reached eternity. You have reached a place where now time does not have any essence. And so here the preacher says there's an appointed time for every matter under heaven. Then he goes on to say a time to bear and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to root up what is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to throw away stones and a time to gather stones. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to seek and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to throw away. 
a time to tear and a time to sow, a time to be silent and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. And then he goes on to ask the important question. What does the worker gain in his toll? Earlier on he said that really it's all vanity of vanities. In fact the Bible speaks of our lives as like a damp in the sun. It's like water in your hand. One minute it's there and the next minute it's gone. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much this morning for the opportunity that we can gather around your throne and around your word and that we can invest time properly here this morning. Taking the next few minutes, the next half an hour to clearly come to a standstill be still and allow these seconds as they now pass by us Lord to be dealt with in the proper way by asking the right question am I heading in the right direction in the name of Jesus I ask this father we thank you Amen. She was about 35 years old when she walked into uh, a meeting where I was preaching. And I can never forget this lady when she came in because she was very pregnant. She had uh, another toddler with her. Her husband was carrying him in. And she went and sat on the left-hand side there in the very back row. And I can never forget her, you know, because... All the time while I was preaching, she was crying all the time. I mean, it just seemed like uh, she never stopped uh, throughout the entire sermon. And when I got through preaching and I gave the altar call, I can never forget that how quickly she responded. Her hand was up. It was like she could not wait. And then when I asked them to come forward, she came forward and knelt down next to the, uh, to the uh, steps and surrendered her life to Christ. Never forget that day. I remember it clearly because the very next morning, early in the morning, my phone rang and it was her husband and he was so excited. He said, Pastor, I don't know if you remember me. And when he told me who he was, I said, yes, sir, I remember you. I remember you, you and your wife and your son coming to church and he said well my wife has just been taken into a hospital and will you please pray uh, our next child is about to be born he was so happy I got dressed very quickly and uh, to make my way to the hospital and before I left the house the phone rang again and this time it was him again but his tone of his voice was very subdued and he was troubled in his heart And I could hear the emotion in his voice. And he said, Pastor, something terrible happened. What happened? He said, well, uh, something went on, you know, there. And while she was giving birth, she suffered a massive heart attack. And my wife died while she was giving birth to the child. I could never forget that, you know, because... First of all, I connected it to that moment the day before when she made, obviously made, the most important decision of her life, not knowing that the hourglass was running out for her. Her whole life, laying ahead of her, she thought, with plans to do this and thus. Not knowing, just like we're sitting here today, not knowing what tomorrow will hold. And tomorrow, her tomorrow, came to an end very abruptly. That's why I remember her. One of the greatest, one of the greatest funerals I ever conducted, if I could call it that, was that one. Because I could do it with such satisfaction. I could tell them that I was there. I was witness to her 
be introduced to the King of Kings and how she met him. And what a celebration it must have been when she came home. And I know what it's like because I've been there to come home and know that you've made it at last. Come on, give the Lord a hand clap of praise. <laughs> Glory to God. You see, as you sit here today, you know, it's not something that I can preach about that you don't know anything about. Every one of us know about time. Right there, as you sit here this morning, that's one thing we all have. My wife and I was just looking at some uh, important people's homes this morning, and, you know, some of them really have it. I looked at President Trump's uh, home, and I'm telling you how beautiful it is. I mean, you know, some people just have it. You know, they have millions and some have billions. But there's one thing that we all have the same. That's time. You see, as you sit here today, there's nobody that can boast with more time than another because it comes constant. It comes 60 seconds in every minute. 60 minutes in every hour. 24 hours in every day, seven days in every week, and so it comes constantly. Nobody can boast on more than the others. You can also not, you know, save it up. There's been times, and we were just talking about it yesterday, some days, and I'm sure you'll agree with me, some days just seem to drag itself. Other days it seems like it just goes by like the wind. I hate, I hate stopping it at red light when there's no traffic coming in the opposite direction. It just, it just gets me. I, you know, I like the circles, you know, the roundabouts that they make, you know, you know, go when you need to go. I hate it. I hate these things. I hate waiting for an elevator. I always tell pastors when they check me into a hotel, please get me on the ground floor. I cannot stand those elevators, you know, having to wait for it to come and go. Uses up your time. I hate staying in long lines. You know, you go to these department stores or sometimes to Walmart and they have, you know, 40 cash registers. I've never been able to understand that. <laughs> have 40 cash registers and, and, and oftentimes just two or three of them, you know, manned. Don't understand those things. Uses up your time. And there's always somebody in front of you that ends up, you know, with a, a product that they have no price for. Oh. <laughs> and they use up your time. I, I, I enjoy, you know, I, I tell you what, uh, I, I enjoy a boat cruise because, you know, in a boat cruise, we all go the same direction. Nobody is in a hurry. I like boat cruises. When you have somebody, you know, up here in front, and especially when you drive in a car and you have these double lines, and you always end up behind some slow driver, normally a very old man, <laughs> at least 60. <laughs> and he, I mean, they just, you know, the speed limit says 55. And they go 35. Those are the moments when my wife don't like to be in the car because the first chance I get, I'm sorry if there's a traffic cop here, I sin. I go past him every time I can. You know, I just cannot stand it. You know, how many times have you uh, uh, wished that you could just save up some time? You know, because today... I mean, you have nothing to do. Tomorrow is going to be a blue Monday. And if you could just take some of today's time and just uh, save it up and use it tomorrow. But no, tomorrow is going to be a day on its own. Every second will be the same as before. You're going to use it up. And even as we sit here today, right now, your heartbeat reminds you. You're, end, you're heading towards your end. Your heartbeat right now is telling you, you know, second 
after second. This time is just pushing you towards that moment when finally it'll stop. And you'll have to stand before God and you'll have to give account. I picked up a, a, traffic, a, a man, a hitchhiker, uh, one time. I like picking up hitchhikers. I, you may not agree, but when I go on a long trip and I, there's a hitchhiker, I pick them up. And I'll tell you why. I can share the gospel with him. And he has to sit there and listen to me. And I, I remember picking up this young man. He was a decent looking young man. I mean, you could just tell that he was, you know, well dressed and so on. Something happened to his car. And he, this was in, in California and he was heading towards L.A. So I started asking some questions. You know, just ordinary questions to bring me to the moment where I could share the gospel with him. So I asked him, you know, just ordinary questions. That's how you start a discussion. Uh, where are you heading to? You know, he told me. Well, uh, do you live there? So he told me, yes, uh, he lives there. Well, uh, where I picked you up from... Uh, where were you coming from? No, he says, I'm in college over there. Oh, so what are you studying for? So he tells me, oh, you're studying, studying to become a doctor. I said... How long do you still have to study? See, everything is connected. How long do you still have to study? Well, uh, he said, I'm in, uh, I've got two more years to go. I said, and then what's going to happen then? Well, then I have to go and serve as an intern. For how long? He told me. And I said, then what then? Well, he says, then I'm going to start my own practice. I said, wow, that's great. And what then? So he said, well, then I'm going to make some money. Oh, well, that's great. What then? He said, well, then um, I'm going to get married. Oh, okay. And what then? Then we're going to have children. What then? Now he starts thinking that it's a time. I mean, it's a game. And he starts, you know, jesting about it. He said, well, then I'm going to have grandkids. What then? And I'm going to get old. <laughs> Retire. And I said, what then? And it just seems like, you know, they avoid the most important issue. Then I pushed him to the very last moment when he'd have to admit. He answered it like this. Well, then I guess I'll die. No. All the others were guesses. Becoming a doctor was a guess. Having children is a guess. Grandchildren, those are guesses. Making money, that's a guess. The thing that you don't have to guess about is you will die. It is appointed unto man once to die and after that the judgment of God. So he said, I guess I'll die. I said, no, no, no. You don't have to guess that. You will die. I said, well, he said, then, I, yeah, I guess you're right. I will die. Uh, I said, then what then? And then he said, it was uneasy. I guess then I'll go to heaven. I can never understand this, you know, how and why people can plan their lives so meticulously. They plan everything to the minutest of detail, but they don't plan for the longest part of the journey. That's eternity. That's in the hereafter. See, this life here, this is very brief. You, you ask any person that's older than my mother, how long has this journey been? And she'll tell you it's been very brief. 94 years to somebody that's 16. That may sound like a long time. Ask somebody that's already 80. Yes. Ask somebody in this place here that's already in their 60s. And they'll tell you it wasn't that long. Right. When I turn 70 this year, I'm thinking that it's just 10 more years and I'll be 80. If I live that long, 20 years and I'll be 
where she's at. Everywhere I go, people want me to become their father. Will you be a father to me? I guess that's just part of time. But you understand, the thing that will last forever and ever will be the year after. When time finally runs out. And it's amazing how people live their lives recklessly. They live their lives with the wish they will go to heaven. Jesus made it very clear to Nicodemus when he said, you must be born again. Without being born again, you will not see the kingdom of God. You must be born again. You must get to a place where you become so sorrowful for your sin. You must get to a place where you become so desperate that you don't mind what other people say or do. You don't mind to run forward and surrender your life to Christ. Because that's really what life is all about. Between the cradle and the grave, that short little interval in between where you and I have to find the key to eternal life. People ask me all the time, they said, you know, what, what did you feel like when you opened your eyes in heaven? Let me tell you something, you know, as you serve the Lord through all these years, you have your low moments. Don't think for one moment that I'm perfect. I'm possibly more perfect than your pastor. <laughs> But we are not, uh, I'm not perfect. There's been the low moments in my life. There's been moments that I'm so happy. I didn't die during that time. And so when I fell off that building and I opened my eyes in heaven, I cannot tell you how relieved I was. When I said, this is what went through my mind. I made it. <laughs> you know, oh my goodness, there's so many people that make it their business for you to be troubled. They make it their business for you to want to go to hell. And wonder above wonders, when I opened my eyes on the other side, I could say, Lord. I made it because of you. Come on, give him a hand clap of praise for you. You know, these past years since 1996, you know, I've oftentimes pondered about the, uh, the statement that the rich man made in Luke 16 when he said to Jesus, you know, and when he found, opened his eyes, or when he said to Abraham, he opened his eyes in, in uh, torment. And he said to Abraham, please send somebody from this side to go and warn my brothers that they must not come here. Surely they will listen to somebody who comes from the other side. And Abraham said, they've got Moses and the prophets. Let, him, let them listen to them. Now I've wondered. You are now listening to somebody who comes from the other side. Who are now telling you, you do not want to take a chance. It is too great in the correct place. It is too wonderful to be in paradise for you to take a wild chance. Somebody said, I don't believe in God. Well, you don't have to, but the time will come when you will. You will. It doesn't matter what you say and what you learn at school or in your college. The time will come when you will realize there is a God in heaven. And you will understand why it says only a fool will say in his heart there is no God. I'm telling you there is a God in heaven. Jesus Christ is the perfect witness who died and rose again and is here today to tell us you don't have to go to hell.
It's time. It's time. You know, you, you sit here today and you've been sitting in the balances and believe me, believe me, you know, if you don't have uh, really make it your business to serve God, then you must be the most pitiful of human beings to spend your time in church. Come on, there's better times you can spend than here in church where somebody is talking to you like I am right now. I mean, if you're not, if you don't, if you're not serious about God, why, why take a chance? Just enjoy the rest of your life because you are going to go to hell. I mean, I'm not sending you there. I'm just telling you that's what the Bible says, you know. God, didn't, God doesn't have plans for man to go to hell. It is his will for all to be saved. And he's here today knocking on your door. And he says, Paul says, today, today, this day, when you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. It's a simple message. It's just a a reminder of what can happen and will happen to all of us pretty soon. When time runs out for you. You know, some, some people hope for that last 11th hour. Sometimes it don't come. Sometimes you're in it right now. Sometimes your 11th hour is at this moment. Like that pregnant lady, not knowing that was her 11th hour. Something inside of her stirred. It was like the Holy Spirit was shaking her. It's time. It's time. It's time. This is the time. Let me wrap this up by saying this. You know, uh, I've seen so many things in my life and so many um, situations. I think one of the worst that I ever witnessed, John Hitchcock and myself, we were in in a car traveling, you know, in heavy traffic hour late in the afternoon on a freeway, and in front of us was a, a, a van, and for some reason, not running fast, I mean, it wasn't more, running more than about 45, maybe 50 miles an hour, her vehicle swerved out of the way, and she hit a pole right in front of us. I mean, she hit it without seemingly touching her brakes. Don't know what happened. And I saw when this thing hit the, uh, the pole, I saw something come out of the car. I thought it was an object or something, but it was her. She obviously didn't have her belt on. And she went flying through the air, I mean, for quite a distance. And then when she hit the ground, she laid still. I was the first one. Me and John was the first one there. You know, we ran towards her and, and she was laying uncomfortably on her face. And I was trained with first aid. I, was, I knew what to do. But before I could do anything, I was pushed aside by two very well-trained first aid nurses or Red Cross nurses. They said, Let's, let me handle this. So they pushed us aside. And I stood aside. But I was right there next to this very beautiful young lady. And you could tell that, you know, something was not right uh, she couldn't breathe, and they tried artificial respiration, tried everything, but it just didn't work. And I heard the one nurse say, we need oxygen, we need oxygen. And I'm standing there saying, she needs time. Time is about to run out. That's terrible. When you stand there next to somebody and you watch them, time is running out. Uh, uh, somebody uh, called on the, on the, on the uh, telephone and uh, an ambulance came against the traffic as fast as it could. We could hear the siren. It wasn't very far when they called it. And, and I could hear the, the ambulance come. And they're trying everything to get her to breathe. It just seems like she was hit real hard in the diaphragm and, and could not, you know, inhale breath. And as the ambulance stopped, I mean, just before it stopped, I looked and she was turning blue. And I said to the nurse, you know, we're we're preachers. Will you please let us pray for her? 
And I laid my hands on, on her body and I prayed. I mean, I prayed like I've never prayed before. God, please don't let her die. I need to at least ask her one important question. Are you ready? It's a terrible feeling to be there at the gate to eternity and watch somebody slip through your fingers and you cannot ask them that question. And I asked her, are you, I mean, I, I prayed. I asked the nurse, let me pray. I prayed and nothing happened. It just seemed like the Holy Spirit put his hand on my mouth and as the ambulance ran up there with the oxygen, she died. Right there with my hands on her. The cops came and while they were investigating there, I walked around, walked over to her vehicle and I saw the drug paraphernalia. I saw half full bottles of whiskey. I looked at the way that she was dressed and it was obvious to me that she was not in connection with God. How sad that is, you know, I mean, you know, you could be a billionaire. But the moment you die, you leave everything behind you. The cops came and they said that we heard you're, you're a pastor. I, yes. And they asked me, well, I, if we give you the address, will you go notify the next of kin? We said, sure. We went to the, to the home of the address and when I knocked on the door and the man opened the door he could he was so happy it was Christmas Eve I looked across his shoulder and the table was all set for a Christmas dinner she was obviously coming home for a Christmas dinner and when he saw my face immediately he mentioned her name whatever it was he said it's Julie isn't it I said yes sir can I come in uh, uh, he let me come in, me and John, we sat down and he went to go and fetch his wife. And when uh, they came into the room, they were expecting the worst. They were expecting it. They were assembly of God, members of a church. And then when I told him what had happened, he asked me, did you get a chance to pray with her? No, sir. No, I couldn't. Then he told me. He said, you know, she, she met the Lord when she was very young. She went to some youth camp, came back there, filled with the Holy Spirit speaking in tongues. And he said, then all of a sudden, she started mixing with the wrong friends. And church was no longer important. We tried everything. The old man cried and he said, we tried everything, but she just did not want to listen. Now, I'm not saying she's in hell. I'm just wondering. Because Jesus said one time, he asked the question, what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world but then loses his soul? What shall it profit? Or what should a man give in exchange for his soul? Was the second question he asked. You know, as you sit here today, that's a question you really need to answer. Because if you don't make right with God, there's nothing you can offer on the other side. We cannot purchase eternity with, with money or with talent. The only price for eternity is one drop of the master's blood. Amen. Calvary. Yes. By embracing Calvary. And as you sit here today, God is talking to you. I keep on, every time I go by you, I hear the name Chris. Is, oh, is your name Chris? No, my brother or, was named Chris. Uh, and, and what has happened to him? My brother actually died of an overdose. Years ago. I am so sorry. And I can tell you right now that, listen, you know, we can never know what happens on the other side until we get home. That's right. It's like that little girl. It, it can never, we never can tell what can happen 
What did happen to her? We don't know. We're going to wait until we get home. If you're sitting here and somebody committed suicide or died of an overdose, you know, that's the Holy Spirit that's obviously encouraging you today. Yes, thank you, Lord. you know, by giving you that, me that name, he's obviously concerned about you, that you can understand. Yes. There is a God in heaven. Yes. Who understands the hearts of men. Come on, give him a hand clap of praise for your glory to God. Can you come and play for me? Can somebody come and play for me on the music? Uh, I want you to close your eyes. You know, this is as much as I want to share this morning. Tonight we're going to start with the revival. But this morning, let's make room for the kingdom. What do you say? Let's put our agendas aside right now. Let's stop thinking about what you're going to do hereafter. What kind of meal you're going to have. Just for a few next few seconds. Listen, this is an investment of your time. It's time. It's time for you to sit now and ponder where you are in the relationship to the master. And who knows why God has me preach this kind of a message in this morning service. Pastor asked me before the service, you want me to bring the books and some of the products so I could advertise it? I said, no, I want to get on with this. I, I felt such an urgency. We'll talk about the books tonight. I just wanted to talk to you. God is talking to you. And now listen, in the next few seconds, you are going to make a decision that will determine eternity for you. Now, some of you have been reluctant to really show your side because you're so afraid of what people will say. You're supposed to be a child of God. And now something has happened and you've just grown cold and distant. This morning, I'm telling you, it's time. It's the right time. It's the correct time. It's God speaking to you. And the Lord is asking you, don't you want to give me back your heart? Give me back your spirit. Come home. Come back home. Come back to the place where your heart is just overwhelmed by his presence. Your, ear, your tears just, you know, very shallow in your eyes. Your face wet with the tears of appreciation and love because of what the master has done. Hey, listen, I know you are not perfect, just like me. But today, when you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. If we say we have no sin, we make him a liar and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sin, then he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from our unrighteousness. Close your eyes, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray over all of us. I include myself here today. And I ask you, O oh Lord, will you help that we will not continue if the path has been rough? Will you, Lord, show them today how you want to make crooked paths straight again? Bring us onto the narrow way. Bring us to a place where we can go home with peace in our hearts and in our lives. Lord, revive our spirits today. Please, Holy Spirit, do a miracle here today. In the name of Jesus. Will you stand with me all over the place? You know, through the years I... Uh, I've, you, you, you see how people do different altar calls and um, something that's always bothered me through the years is how preachers sometimes allow people to close up their eyes, you know, bow their heads so that somebody can get a chance to slip out secretly and come forward so nobody else can see them. To me, that's so wrong. I feel that if you cannot make a stand for Christ openly, here in church where we all love him 
you're not going to make a stand for him outside these doors. It takes a man and a woman of courage to serve God. To stand on what is right, stand for what is right and, and shun that which is wrong. Today, if you know God spoke to your heart and you may be a member of the church or you may, may have been with the church a long time, but you know that your heart is not right with God, then don't take a chance. And in a few seconds, I mean, this is how much we have left of this service, of your time. I'm using your time. But you're giving God some of your time. And in a few moments, I'm going to tell you it's time for you to come forward. And come stand here so we can pray together with you. And then you don't worry who's going to see you, who's not going to see you. Because when you get to heaven, like that pregnant lady, you will be so happy that you made that decision. Now, if you're ready while they sing, I want you to just boldly walk out. Come and stand right here in front because I want to pray for you. Are you ready? Now it's time. Just come walk out. Tell somebody, I'm sorry, excuse me. And then as they come, clap hands for them as they come. Will you please? Come. Come. All over the house. All over the house. Just come. 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 They're still coming. Glory to God. Come. Oh, Lord. They're still coming. Keep on clapping. There's still people coming. Glory to God. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.